Hello and welcome back to the Notcast. It is episode 270. It is Monday 20th of February 2023 and today I am starting off a new band. Although of course those of you who have seen the title will know exactly who I'm going to be talking about. Uh, a band that 39 years ago today on the 20th of February 1984 released their an eponymous, I need to think about how I pronounce that, self-titled debut LP, uh, one of the finest songwriting duos of all time, uh, better than the Beatles, don't hate me, don't hate the player, hate the game, uh, Morris and Ma, and that album was The Smiths, and today I am going to be talking through uh, the first album period, the band from their formation through to the release of the fourth, fifth single, depending on your point of view, um, the uh, the version of Hand in Glove with Sandy Shaw. And since a good academic quotes his sources, I'm not a good academic, and as I said before, none of this is uh, meant to be anything more than just a dude talking to his phone about his record collection. Um, I have five major books uh, which I have used to crib some of my information from. I'm going to credit them because I can. This is uh, Mozipedia by, I think, Simon Gardart. It's an essential reference book. It's also found in charity shops for about five pounds, if, uh, if you're lucky. Um, there is also <coughs> the Smith's Visual Dictionary, a documentary by um, Johnny Rogan, uh, a man who should probably die in a hotel fire, according to a certain well-known Mancunian-born singer. This peepholism, or peepholism, which is the, um, the book of the artwork uh, of, of Morrissey from 1983 through to, I think, 1992. And uh, we also have, and, and last, definitely not least, um, the two most essential of the books, um, Set the Boy Free by Johnny Marr. Uh, this version signed by everybody's uh, favourite guitarist, one of the best guitarists in the world, Mr Johnny of Marr. Um, and perhaps a more truculent, devious and unreliable tale told by Morrissey in his book, Autobiographer. Uh, this one, not signed by Morrissey, by the way. And uh, as we progress through me talking through the Smiths and Morrissey's career, um, more facts will emerge, I suspect it's fair to say. So Morrissey's autobiography sets the, sets the, um, the stage pretty clearly with its opening sentences um, which are my childhood is streets upon streets upon streets upon streets streets to define you and streets to confine you with no sign of motorway freeway or highway and that is one way of describing life in urban britain in the 60s and 70s johnny's which i have not um, checked in advance opens perhaps a little differently. I stood outside, gazing up on one of those mornings when the sun scorched the pavements and Mancunians used to say it cracked the flags. Well, there you are. Two different sides of the same story, the yin and the yang, the light and the shade. Um, and I think that uh, it's fair to say, in my opinion, and this is in no way a criticism of the Smiths, they are one of the most adolescent bands ever. That is not necessarily, in fact, it definitely isn't a criticism. Having been an adolescent, in fact, I was a teenager for what feels like about 20,000 years. Um, I certainly came to listening to the Smiths when I was grand old age of about 14 or 15. So by the time I got to the Smiths, the Smiths had just died. They were a smoking husk at the roadside as Morrissey forged on and some guy called Johnny Marr, who I was meant to know about, was playing guitar for Brian Ferry and doing a song called The Right Stuff on the Top of the Pops and playing with the Pretenders. Um, by saying they're the most adolescent band ever, um, firstly, I think they're a band, if you hear them when you're about 17, you're like, oh my God, no band understands me the way this band understands me. Um, the second one is, there's a lot of things which are, I think, when you're young or younger, Actually, I'm not young. I'm old now. In fact, technically, unless I live past the age of 98, I'm middle-aged now. When you're young, 
there is a huge chunk of your life where you have to expend energy on trying to find out, well, who am I? What am I going to do? Where am I going to be? Am I going to have a job? I was looking for a job and then I found the job and heaven knows I'm miserable now. You know, will the world end in the daytime or the nighttime? What will happen? And that's the kind of thing when you're adolescent, you're just trying to find your identity and you're trying to find out who you are and what you believe in and what you're going to be for the rest of your life. And obviously that changes and refines over time. When I was younger, I didn't think 40 something me would be this guy. I thought he'd be richer and have more hair, but you know, that's how that's life. But they encapsulated and addressed a lot of the emotions that were very, very common, especially when you were uncertain about your place in the world and whether the world was going to be a friend or an enemy or a mixture of both. And for the childhood that Smiths grew up in, uh, so Morrissey born on the 22nd of May 1959, uh, Mike Joyce on the 1st of June 1963, uh, Johnny Marr on the 31st of October 1963, and Andy Rourke on the 17th of January 1964. Um, these were people that grew up very, very clearly in the 60s and the 70s and the early part of the 80s. And for me, although I was born 10 years after, well, nine years after any member of the Smiths, um, for me, my experiences as a 10, 12, 20 year old growing up in a suburban town in, well, north of London, that was mostly rainy and famous for its music. Um, I felt that I had, or at least I'd lived a very similar life to the members of the band. And so the things that they were talking about the, the the language that they were using in the songs and in the music were was language that I didn't hear when I listened to wankers like White Snake. You know, White Snake were all about exploring the horizontal possibilities of love, or as um, David Coverdale would say, tonight might be the night that you meet the love of your life. Just don't tell your wife. Um, whereas obviously the Smiths were perhaps uh, a little less macho, a little less gung ho a little less 80s. I think about what else was happening in the 80s at the time. Rambo was huge. Red Dawn was a, a film, which, by the way, I recently bought on Blu-ray. It has not aged well. You know, action movies with Chuck Norris and Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone with, with names like Punching Commies and, you know, Commando and things like that were the, the tone and the culture which I was growing up in. And being a sensitive little flower... Uh, wearing glasses, I might as well have had a sign saying bully me on my forehead. I did not recognise the world that I saw in that culture. Um, there were a number of kind of bogeymen that were hanging around. Um, I grew up very clearly from the age of six to the age of 17 under the rule of Margaret Thatcher. I felt very firmly, very clearly the influence of her and her politics on my life and my existence and the financial struggles that I and my family had when we were growing up seemed to be directly caused by bad decisions made by politicians that weren't interested in anybody but themselves and their rich mates. Um, I grew up in a place that was full of concrete, grey streets, poverty, uh, tight purses, tight houses, tightly packed, you know, suburbs and 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 uh, detached and semi-detached and terraced homes where all the houses were living all over and on top of each other uh, i was very aware of the world in which i grew up in the politics which seemed very xenophobic i remember the um the sun newspaper had the headline that said gotcha with a picture of the general belgrano which is a ship not an actual general um on the front um, I remember the stories of a, a guy called Bible John who had murdered some women in Glasgow and the Moors murderers in the 60s that had preyed on children that could have grown up next to me had we both been in Manchester. Um, one of my first memories is the watching on television, small television, in, in a road called Steepwood Croft, um, news footage of the Birmingham pub bombings. In 1973 knowing that that was a pub that I actually went to when I'd grown up and I, I sat at you know the table that the bomb was at and I didn't realize because I was like 19 in uh, the mid 90s but knowing that 
and the pub that was ne underneath the rotunda um, and just feeling that there were random acts of atrocities that were under my feet um, and they could be small acts of, of brutality you know playground brutality uh, bullying all that type of thing and then much bigger ones uh, like wars or the miners strike um, and I think that we had in in Morrissey and in Johnny Maher we had two personalities that I, I felt that having read both the autobiographies I feel that there's a little bit of me in both of them. Uh, Morrissey, to quote a, a fantastic music journalist, Morrissey is a musician who, I think the best way to describe it was uh, a, music, a failed music journalist who became a musician, upturning the cliche that all music journalists are failed musicians. Um, but he didn't, very clearly, just wasn't made for these times, as Brian Wilson would have it. Um, he didn't fit in, didn't work or operate in the normal way in which, you know, you would expect people go, well, why isn't he compliant to the world? And I'm always reminded of Will Sinnott from The Shaman, who once said that the only sane response to living in a psychotic society is to be psychotic. Um, and you think about the, the virtues and the, um, the, the worldviews that are uh, expressed and symbolised in, in parts of capitalist culture, and you kind of go... If this was a person, they'd be remorseless and possibly a psychopath. You know, Morris's world was had dreams that that didn't accommodate P sixties or tax structures or or the nine to five environments or paid employment in the way in which most people understood it. The idea of having a boss and annual leave and um, you know doing things because people told you to in exchange for money were not concepts which really worked well with his personality um, and. I think as a as a child and adolescent, he built a bedroom retreat, which, you know, when I was that age, uh, 17, 19, 20, um, I did a lot of very similar things. It's, you know, I built a world inside my bedroom, which was a safe space. There was a room and it was it felt like it was a prison cell, but it was a world that I made and I controlled and nothing could get in there. It was my retreat. I built a world inside because the outside world wasn't good enough for me. It didn't fit. It didn't didn't work in the way in which I saw the world working. I looked at the outside world and thought there was a broken machine there that somehow was stumbling along and operating. And there was um, a little bit of flirtation with uh, being in bands, rehearsing with bands, that type of thing. But there was an element of identity and isolation, the idea of what could have been. Certainly at a certain point, in autobiography, Morrissey kind of indicates that he had felt very clearly that not only had he missed the bus, but he'd missed the boat and the boat had sank. Um, and there was a degree of isolation in that going, well, actually, if I can't operate in the world the way that works for me, then I'm not going to operate inside the world. Um, there was an element of, well, what could have been? And then with, with Johnny Marr, and we had a slightly different approach with Johnny, um, who was somebody for whom uh, this is something I really closely identified with is an element of he had more dreams and ambition than he had the ability to realise as a teenager. His first record was Jeepster by T-Rex. Music became a way for him to understand the world around him. It was the, the language through which he translated the reality in which he, he existed. He was a Bowie fan. Um, one of his favourite records is The Stooges' War Power, which, by the way, is incredible and has its uh, 50th birthday this, this year and uh, he said I used to go to record shops and bookshops every Saturday without fail as a teenager that was me I did exactly the same thing and if you're about my age you probably did exactly the same thing you took your money that you saved during the week you went to the bookshops and you went to the record shops early on Saturday mornings you bought the second-hand bargains that people had traded in you built a world in that record collection because Spotify didn't exist, the only way to access the music was to own a physical copy of the record and to hope to, and then tape the record and listen to the tape so you wouldn't fuck up the vinyl. You know, CDs were these glossy things that were incredibly expensive and bought by people that like Dire Straits and Genesis. You bought the vinyl. That's what it was all about. And that's how you access the world. And those songs illuminated 
parts of the world for you. Um, and so we had, in 1976, the uh, Sex Pistols gig at the Free Trade Hall in Manchester um, that uh, was attended by Morrissey and uh, most of the people that became Joy Division and Mick Hucknall from Simply Red. And I'm very sorry, I do not like Simply Red at all. Johnny Marr was probably not old enough to go. He wasn't even, I think, 17 at the time, not even probably 16, actually. In fact, he wasn't even 13, come to think of it, so no wonder he didn't go to that. Um, but uh, he was rehearsing at TJ's in 1979, the same rehearsal studios as Joy Division, later used by the Stone Roses. Um, in fact, on the floor below Joy Division, apparently. Um, and so, without knowing it, was deeply ensconced in a music scene that, you know, like for me, growing up in Birmingham in the in, in the 70s, in the 80s, seeing the people that I vaguely knew in local bands, in bands like The Wonder Stuff and um, Pop Leads Itself, Ned's Atomic Dustbin, the Charlatans were kind of from Wolverhamptonish nearby, you know, those type of bands. Is, to me, it felt completely normal that bands that I vaguely knew, that I saw at gigs and, and were on top of the pops and were on the covers of the NME and had number one records, um, Johnny Marr may very well have felt the same type of thing, is that this, this kind of sense that that was the normality that he lived in. And this was the normality that I lived in as well, that the world where you kind of vaguely were on not in chatting terms with people that were in bands that made records and appeared on television and, and flew all over the world. Um, and there wasn't anyone to say, that's not normal. You know, parts of my, my childhood, as I now realise it, we're not normal. We're very far from normal. But I don't know what normal is anyway. There is no such thing as normal. And to me, it just felt like the reality I was living in, for all its weird and idiosyncratic bits, that was the world I lived in. Um, and so um, Johnny Moore also lived with a guy called Andrew Berry. Andrew Berry was a hairdresser. Andrew Berry apparently uh, gave both Morrissey the Quiff and Bernard Sumner I think it was called a French crop. So it launched two of the biggest hairstyles of the 80s. And uh, Johnny formed a band. And um, the band had, in its initial days, I mean, he formed a number of bands, by the way. Um, but after a couple of false starts, um, somebody advised that he should go and see a chap called Morrissey and knocked on his door. And Morrissey opened the door and there was Johnny Marr and another chap and... They started writing songs and that was the start of it that was the start of the smiths um, the moment by the way in which the film england is mine ends is the moment at which the story becomes genuinely interesting um, and the first version of the band kind of rotated through a few names uh, i think one was smithsdom um, before settled on the name of the smiths and by the way my theory is you can tell how good a band is by how good its name is. There are many bands with bad names who are brilliant, but there is not one band with a great name who aren't really bloody interesting. Um, so think about the names of some of the bands that I like, The Wonder Stuff, The Smiths, New Order, uh, Pop Release itself. These are great names for bands. They really, really are. It's not like you're going to call yourself the fucking Snuts or something, you know. One of the things that bands really do try harder, I know that there are only a certain number of band names in the world, but right now I could think of several that I would sell to you. If you wanted Eaten by Cats, for example, that's a great name for a band. You can buy that off me for £50. Uh, Volume, a name that my band, when I was in a band, used to have. That's a great name for a band. I'm surprised no other band really has made made a whack of it, really. Uh, and then, then you end up, yeah, with bands with names like The Cribs and The Snuts and whatever. And I'm like, Really? You're going to call yourself that? That's not very imaginative, is it? You might as well call yourself Band 142 or something. You know, and, and like, well, we're different from Band 143. We're at least one better than Band 141. But we're not, we're, we're, we're about mm, seven times worse uh, than Band 1242. All right, fine. Front 242, whatever. So there, that's the Smiths. And I don't know why I'm going on about band names. The first version of the band had uh, Simon Wollstonecroft, who I think uh, later joined The Fall and was in the, the Stone Roses for a short period of time. 
uh, Daryl Hibbert was on bass and they recorded some demos in June 1982. Um, those demos being The Hand That Rocks the Cradle, Don't Blow Your Own Horn and I Want a Boy, um, which I think was with Stephen Pomfret, I think, on drums. I don't know. I should know, but I don't know. And in July 1982, uh, yeah, uh, Hib Hibbert joins um, and the, is their bass player, Dale Hibbert, for one, one gig. Um, and Wilson Croft is, plays on the uh, studio recordings. And they do a demo at Decibel Studios. Decibel Studios is the one that was used by Joy Division. So, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, and they did The Hand that's, That Rocks the Cradle and Suffer Little Children. Um, two of the songs that later appeared, less than two years later, on... The debut album. Mike Joyce joined in October 1982. The band played their first gig on the 4th of October 1982. Andy Rourke joined in December 1982. And Andy having been a, a, um, a bass player with Johnny and some other bands as well. And uh, they did a, a, a demo at the Drone Studios. Uh, and then the first circulating Smith show took place on February the 4th, 1983, 40 years ago already, which is pretty, pretty much shocking, really, when you think about it being 40 years ago, because to me, it doesn't feel like it was 40 years ago, although admittedly the gig only happened when I was nine. And the uh, the first track, I think, that was recorded by, by the band that was released um, was on the B side of their first single, the track. Is Handsome Devil, which I think was recorded on the 4th of February 1983. Uh, and that made the B-side of their first single, the single being Hand in Glove. Uh, here's the uh, the seven inch with the, uh, the, the phone number on the back. I don't know if that makes it rare. I think the phone number was taken off after the first 6,000 copies. Um, there was also a mistake where it was printed in a negative sleeve, so it was mostly blue with silver as opposed to mostly silver with a bit of blue in and as, as far as um you know debut singles go that's unambiguous isn't it that really is very clearly kind of laying out exactly what it is putting a, an image of a naked man on the cover of your first single it very clearly signified we are not like other bands and the um the first single hands in glove one of the best debut singles of all time opens with that line hand in glove the sun shines out of our behinds this love is different because it's us it's not like any other love and you know from there it's like very very clearly kind of laying its 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 colors to the mast and its balls to the wall about what it is and what it signifies um this one was the first single it did not chart i think um and in fact i think it's only ever been on a seven inch and um, some of those reproduction seven inches and cd singles that are on various later period 2008 era warner brothers reissues um, but this is a one of the best debut singles of all time and um i think it's been because it was only ever a seven inch you know it wasn't a 12 inch or anything it, it kind of got a little bit lost in the shuffle actually in the band's discography which of course is why the second uh album that the smiths do which i'm not discussing is Hatful of Hollow. That comes in a future episode, by the way, when I talk about the Smiths, but not today. Um, and they had, uh, first things first, they had a pill session. Um, well, their first pill session on the 18th of May. So Hand in Glove was released May 1983, um, and the band hadn't played that many shows at that point, but they were starting to play more shows over time and become a little bit more uh, well-known. And they, they did their, their first Peel session, the first time many people heard them, um, in May 1983, recorded on the 18th of May 1983, broadcast on the 31st of May 1983. Four songs, um, which were also released um, after the event. This was a 12-inch, which I think came out around about 1988, um, to try and clamp down on the bootleggers. And later got a CD release here as a standalone release in 1994 um, and uh, these were absolutely essential to understanding the Smith story this is the first time that most people got a chance to hear the Smiths unless you got one of the singles uh, and there were four tracks on here what difference does it make miserable lie reel around the fountain and a studio recording of handsome devil i don't think a studio recording of handsome devil has been issued apart from this pill session actually 
and uh, it's um, one of the tracks, by the way, on here. And I, I can't remember which one it is. I think it's Miserable Lie has not been reissued apart from on this set. So if you uh, if you're a Smith completist, you do need to get the Peel Sessions as a standalone release. And in May 1983, um, Mike Joyce's position, I think, was, was, a, was a little bit threatened, I think. I think Simon Wollstonecroft was, was back, albeit somewhat briefly, um, although I don't think there's any evidence of that, i.e. there's no recordings or photographs or anything. Maybe it was for a studio session or, or so. Um, and then in June, 26th of June, 1983 there was a second radio session so the smiths were using the radio sessions as a way of both demoing their album and getting that uh, important cash flow because i think you got paid 150 pounds per member if you did a pill session or you did a bbc session so that was 600 pounds in the band's coffers which is you know no small amount of money in 1983 no small amount of money in 2023 it's just slightly smaller than it was in uh, 1983 and uh, again recorded four songs uh, for David Jensen, uh, and these were Hand in Glove, These Things Take Time, uh, You've Got Everything Now, and Reel Around the Fountain. I, I think, oh no, Wonderful Woman, actually, um, was was the uh, the other one. And those were bootlegs, heavily bootlegs, and in the tape trading circles, um, Smith radio sessions were a hot tape to get. Um, certainly a number of them were, were bootlegs later on. I think some of them appear on, on this absolutely essential Bootleg Smiths box set, Songs That Changed Your Life, um, which has uh, BBC radio sessions on it, the Oxford show from 1985, complete Troy Tate sessions, uh, a DVD with three live shows and TV appearances, um, audio from the Brixton Academy, Birmingham Fighting Cocks, and uh, vinyl rarities, Derby Assembly Rooms and Belfast Queen's University in 1986. You can pick this up for about £50, by the way. Um, I strongly recommend it, by the way, if you're into Smith's bootlegs. It's pretty much the one to get. Um, but those uh, that David Jensen session, again, brought, an, uh, brought the total number of songs that were, were out to 10, uh, really, maybe 9 uh, overall. And the band were starting to get a real buzz around them. Um, not that I know, I was 10 years old and in Birmingham and finding out about this by reading newspapers after the fact. Um, and the band signed a deal with Rough Trade Records. The deal with Rough Trade Records effectively said Morrissey and Ma are the Smiths. And the other people were just you know, paid sessioneers or, or paid musicians. And effectively, if Morrissey or Ma left, then that was a problem. If the other guys left, they weren't actually on the contract with Rough Trade. This, of course, would later come to bite the band in the arse, as detailed for 50 pages in autobiography, uh, which, of course, when that comes, I will get to talking about that. I think it was a little naive of Mike and Andy to, to not have their names on the contract or not to get an agreement in writing about the payments that they would be getting so that they understood right from the off, as opposed to working on an assumption. But we are where we are. That is what it is. And and the band signed um, the, the the deal with Rough Trade in uh, July 1983 and did their second uh, David Jensen radio session on the 25th of August. Uh, this time playing Accept Yourself, I Don't Owe You Anything, Pretty Girls Make Graves and Reel Around the Fountain. And also were did some recordings for what was going to be their debut LP um, with a producer called Troy Tate. And the Troy Tate versions of the album were scrapped uh, at no small cost. I think it cost about £60,000 for them to make the decision not to release the Troy Tate recordings, which effectively is the abandoned version of the band's debut album. Now, the Troy Tate recordings um, are... They sound very stilted. The band isn't confident in the studio. Uh, it sounded like a demo. Uh, it, it, it had they recorded a total of 14 songs um, and it just didn't sound it didn't sound good enough if it had been the band's debut album the the great kind of regret that everyone would have had is that it didn't capture the majesty of the smiths on stage these troy tate demos luckily they're all on youtube so you can hear them without having to buy them um, and that, that includes uh, Real Around the Fountain, You've Got Everything Now, Miserable Lie, These Things Take Time, Wonderful Woman, Handsome Devil, 
hand in glove, what difference does it make? I don't owe you anything. Suffer little children and pretty girls make graves. And the version of pretty girls make graves, by the way, I think was, was later issued on the uh, on the B-side of the, the band's last single during their, their lifespan. Um, and these were, were recorded um, in 1983. And um, the the running order on the LP, by the way, this, this bootleg LP, which I got for £5, bargain, um, has been rejuggled from the original demo tapes. So it resembles the running order of the studio LP. And here is my, my handwritten notes that, that I made uh, in 19, ooh, about 1993, I think by compiling it, by reading it various books and putting all the information together so that I understood what the running order was for the LP. I thought I was the fucking business when I got this bootleg LP, uh, without knowing, of course, that many other people have it. And a CD version is on the songs that saved your life, by the way. Um, there was a, a, a second Peel session uh, on the 14th of September. And this Peel session featured uh, this charming man, Back to the Old House, um, this night has opened my eyes um, and still ill so there's plenty of songs that the band have got even if you just listen to the radio sessions you've effectively got something like 18 20 smith songs including the singles um, but they still only had one single out they were playing small venues the fighting cocks in birmingham not very big maybe three four hundred people um it's probably a curry house now actually um and the band had decided to scrap the Troy Tate sessions and to carry on uh, bench testing these new songs that they were writing a fiercely prolific way. Right, you know, there, I think there was there was one day when when Mar, uh, when when Johnny Marr wrote, "Please, please, please, let me get what I want." And how soon is now on the same day? Now, not bad for a day's work. Most bands could benefit from that kind of uh, work rate. It's fair to say. And on the twenty eighth of October. Um, the, the band's second single, the, the first one that, that really got any substantial kind of uh, play came out um, and it was This Charming Man, which is here as the uh, the Rough Trade 7-inch, Rough Trade 136, uh, featuring um, Gene on the B-side, sung by the Morrisseys. Um, this is a carries on from the tradition of the previous sleeve art and what you'll see in the rest of the smith sleeve art is a you know a set of images of, of people in unusual circumstances normally normally depicted in monochrome uh, often based on films or or art pieces um, so for example this is a, a photograph of jean Marais. i don't know if that is french movie star from some film or a publicity slot or something um, and then you can see the the other covers uh, also featuring shots of people from history, kind of like drawing back to an idealised, almost sepia-tinted version of reality. And all of the, the Smith covers are, I think, really, really interesting, um, as is detailed in Peopleism, uh, primarily because um, what they're trying to do is to depict a rose-tinted or um, treated version of reality that no longer exists. So the Jean Marais is from the Cocteau film War Thee, which was made in 1949. And whilst the second single was originally intended to be real about the fountain, for example, they decided that that wasn't going to work. Um, the, uh, the photograph on the front of Hand and Glove is, according to Peepholism, an unknown male photograph uh, by Jim French, taken from Margaret Walter's book, The Nude Male. Um, and and then of course you had the the cover to the third single uh, and the cover to the third single is what difference does it make uh, this here although the seven inch doesn't do actually depict it the the 12 inch i do have is terrid stamp uh holding a chloroform uh pad and uh, that's from the film the collector from 1965 and since they didn't quite get the rights for it um, because uh, Terence Stamp objected to his photograph being used, Morrissey later later reposed for it with a glass of milk in 1983, and uh, only the the close and most attentive will notice that that uh, the photograph will have taken. Most people wouldn't have even noticed. Oh, it's just Morrissey with a glass of milk. Nonetheless, we're racing ahead, and I should be talking about this charming man. Um, which for many, many years, the original single version of this charming man here on two 12 inches 
and a 7 inch was deleted and unavailable and so for me the, the first time I heard this Charming Man and in fact the only version of this Charming Man that I'd heard for many many years was the Peel Session version which is on the uh, Hatful of Hollow compilation I'm sat there going I don't get it why does everyone say that this is an incredible song it's good but I don't don't I don't grasp it I don't know why it's so good of course when you heard the original seven inch version that, that runs on a, a different arrangement with, with a predominant arpeggio guitar riff you listen to it and go oh now i get it because the bill session version just wasn't quite as good um and this charming man i think the press releases were the first time that the word smithton were referred to in writing as smithton being almost a uh, a word that, that describes the band's fandom but also the band's activity and its creation of uh, almost a self-contained world of the Smiths, where nothing else really exists outside of that. And the best bands do this. The best bands create with their work an artistic identity where you actually start to conceive that you're actually you're entering into a secret universe uh, which where the Suede of the Gods or Smiths of the Gods or, you know, Metallica are, where you're entering a self-created world where the band has created their own universe because the one outside of the band is unsatisfactory much in the same way as that most teenagers in their teenage bedrooms when they were my age in 1980 something 90 something created a universe inside our bedrooms that was made out of our record collections that were far superior to the outside world of course if you interact in the outside world and you listen to the kind of songs that were popular in 1983 or 1988 or 1993 uh, and let's say 1993 was too unlimited and take that 1988 might have been you know Kylie Minogue and Jason Donovan 1983 might have been Russ Abbott um I don't know fucking chirpy chirpy cheap cheap or or um Renny and Renata doing save your love for me my darling save your love and you kind of go no wonder you're going to turn inside and create a world that that recognizes and reflects the reality that you live in as opposed to this meaningless fucking dross which is shoved down your throat and when you go into a shop especially in the days before you had walkmans and if you went out and you were exposed to listening to songs you hated by artists you despised that meant absolutely nothing or of course white snake doing in the still of the night here's a song for you about horizontal variations of love I don't like White Snake, in case any of you have wondered, but I'm sure you'd already worked that out. Because why pamper life's complexities when the leather runs smooth on the passenger seat, as um, the Smiths had it. And who, and, and with these songs, there was a very specific use of an arcane, almost defunct area of the English language. So the you know the lyrics of punctured bicycle on a hillside desolate, will nature make a man of me yet? Why pamper life's complexities when the leather runs smooth on the passenger seat and you kind of go well that's a kind of version of, of english which you don't normally get in popular culture think about big songs that came out from american artists and uh they're, they're talking about you know the wind in their hair and the car and the beach and the woman and uh, always the woman and all that stuff and their jet planes and looking for nothing but a good time how can you resist girls 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 all of this and all of the songs come from a world that that certainly for me as a 15 16 17 year old i was like i don't know this universe i'm never going to know this universe these songs are alienating you know to, to live and exist in a culture where the songs that you were hearing were songs that had nothing to do with your life you were kind of listening to them and going i don't understand this this is an alien reality and it's quite oppressive and quite depressing if you look at culture and um you look to Los Angeles for the language that we use because London is dead. But then you look to Los Angeles for the language that you use and you look at that and you kind of go, there's no, there's nothing I can relate to here. You know, I don't know what a sidewalk is. I don't know what a diaper is. You know, we spell colour with a U, you know, the correct way it's meant to be spelled. Sorry, American people. We, it's called English for a reason. We invented it. But that doesn't mean we're good at it, much the same way as England's very good at inventing sports and terrible at playing it. Um, 
you know, and and these are the, the there's a there's that lyric about you know the a jumped up pantry boy who never knew his place. He said, "Return the ring," and you kind of think about the dynamic that exists inside that type of song. And you go, "These are not the subject matters of songs that you'll have." Sometimes it's not learned experience. Sometimes it's not lived experience. It's it's experience that you've seen through films and books and television. Because if you find that the outside world is unsatisfactory and you don't engage with it, then the only thing that you have around, you know, things like love or relationships or fast cars, uh, films like Giant and American Graffiti or, uh, you know, Breathless or The Motorcycle or The Bicycle Thief, for example, or, or yeah. The Outsiders, which came out in 1983, or Rumblefish, these type of things. You know, you, you create a world that, you, the, that came through books and music and, you know, uh, films, and those were the things that helped you and gave you a life and nourished you when you didn't have an outside world to go to or you didn't like the outside world that you were forced to endure every time you had to go to school or work or wherever it is that you went to do whatever you wanted to do. You know, the only time that you were truly alive as a teenager was when you might have been buying records or reading a book or, or watching a film and, um, you know, understanding certain things about reality from that which you otherwise perhaps wouldn't have necessarily understood and that is why this charming man is one of the, the greatest singles of all time it's so quintessentially british um, and it uses a, an arcane version of the english language which didn't even exist at the time very few people were talking about pantry boys and punctured bicycles and desolate hillsides and america doesn't have desolate hillsides and if it ever did it certainly would never have been on the a side of a single it might have been where bon jovi was walking out of a church or where um, you know bands like I don't know Rat and Venom and stuff might have posed moodily on the back covers of their LPs, but for the UK, the desolate hillside was just outside your window. You just look at that, and there it is. Um, and so you know this charming man, uh, I think, became a relatively small hit. Um, it had the seven inch, it had a twelve inch, uh, which was backed with "Accept Yourself, um, Wonderful Woman." Uh, here and this featured uh, two versions of the song the Manchester and London arrangements one recorded in Manchester one recorded in London um, and uh, I think the uh, I think the the version that's only on the 12 inch most closely resembles the harmonica led uh, kind of less pacey uh, version um, which was on the the Peel session and so when I, as I said when I first heard the Peel session version of this charming man I was kind of like I don't get it. I, I don't. I don't understand it. Why is this song meant to be fantastic? But the version that's on the the seven inch um, is the you know the the version which um, most people heard and was, was played in the indie clubs. I'm like, what is this weird version of the song? And talking of weird version of the songs, the second twelve inch, RTT one three six um, of this charming man. Uh, this one. Let me just quickly check. Yeah, this one comes with Accept Yourself and Wonderful Woman as well, which means, actually, that I think the remix 12-inch version of it, I don't have. But that's OK, because the remix 12-inch was uh, a limited edition. It was only available briefly, um, and I think it was only available for a week, and then was withdrawn. And then there was, um, when the single was re-released on CD in 1992 to go alongside Smith's compilation, the remixes, the New York vocal and the New York Instrumental, um, remixed by Francis Kavakian, who freshly taken his hands off uh, the Kraftwerk, um, remixed it and made them these funky, kind of extended, almost kind of, um, you think about, actually, I don't know why that picture of the Smiths is in there, because that's from 1987, uh, and this, this recording was from 1983, um, but explored the a side of the Smiths that not many people really talked about, which is when you listen to Johnny Marr's guitar play, you listen to the way that he blends melody and rhythm and groove together, um, what you can hear in, in all of those versions, um, and especially on the New York vocal and instrumental, is the kind of huge influence of bands like Chic and uh, Disco, and it's kind of a very funky bass line, which doesn't necessarily sit comfortably with what you might think the Smiths were. Um, but yeah, there you are. The, uh, the single was released on the 28th of October, 1983, uh, just edging in before Johnny Marr's 20th birthday and um, was uh, relatively successful. Um, I think it, um, although Rough Trade were not really marketing these songs in any way, the single reached number 25 and the Smiths were the first Rough Trade group to appear 
on top of the pops um and the uh the the band then went in and um, started recording their, their debut album and they played a lot of shows they played derby on the 7th of december 1983 um, in the assembly rooms which was broadcast on british television and is available on youtube and also on dvd uh, in this box set um, and in early 1984 uh, morrissey moved down to london and the band released their first single from the album uh, what difference does it make this is the terence stamp sleeve um, and it's backed with back to the old house and these things take time both tracks which you would have heard on the 14th of september in the david jensen session um, and uh, also the uh, the seven inch this version here was backed with i think it's back to the old house this is the morrissey sleeve seven inch as mentioned previously and it opens itself up with, I think it's fair to say, some, some interesting lyrics because it opens with, all men have secrets and here is mine, so let it be known. Um, the kind of way, as I said, like Smithton being a cult, a secret world which had been invented and created for the band's fans, it's kind of going, all men have a secret, here is mine, come in, I'm going to let you into that secret. There was an invitation to people that were fans of the bands to join a secret club um, which nobody else was really meant to know about. Which, of course, carried itself through the later Smith's material with uh, album titles like The World Won't Listen. Um, and what difference does it make made it into the charts? Um, although Morrissey did prefer the Peel Session version of the song. And the Peel Session version is the preferred version by the group and the version used on reissues. Um, and Morrissey walked out during the recording of what difference does it make. Um, and... Um, I think uh, it was at that point that Johnny Marr negotiated with Andy and Mike the 10% royalty verbally. Um, they cancelled some dates um, following the release of the single, uh, apparently due to flu. And then the band's debut album, The Smiths, was released on the 20th of February 1984. So it was 39 years ago today uh, that The Smiths began to play. And uh, this is... Um, I think this is, this is actually not a great debut LP. Um, some of the band's best songs aren't on it. So This Charming Man isn't on there. Hands in Glove is on there, but in a remixed form. Um, the sequencing of the album is not particularly great. Um, and it was recorded piecemeal at various cheap studios in September, October and November 1983. The Smiths were learning to be the Smiths. And whilst all the songs were semi-autobiographical, they were tales of regret and desire and a permanent adolescence of confusion and identity. And kind of going, well, you know, who am I and what am I going to be? This, by the way, is the Greek version of the album, uh, which was released, unlike most versions of it, on Virgin Records. A relatively rare groove there uh, but since it was greek it was also pressed on slightly thinner vinyl slightly cheaper cardstock and thinner paper um, and it features as its uh, cover star joe d'alessandro cold from andy warhol's flesh the un uh, uncropped version of this picture here is receiving a blowjob from a male prostitute so apparently there were some embarrassed moments when um, mike joyce kind of handed it to his mum and dad and went what's going on here on the front cover of the album uh, nothing well don't carry on um, and uh, so, so there you go. So, this album, I think, changed a lot of things because before this, there weren't that many bands where you kind of listened to and you went, I identify with the single, I identify with the lyrics, I identify with the quandaries um, that are in there. Um, it was a, you know, the name The Smiths was a deliberate choice, it was working class, it was um, tied in with a historical connotation. So, a lot of surnames the way for people used to be linked by what they used to do so reed i did something with reeds a walker did a lot of walking a smith was a smith and he you know worked with his hands and he created things with his hands and the the, the forgers of work and the smiths as a band kind of identified themselves with them with forgers we're doing physical work here we're we're forging sound and art and we're crafting it out of nothing using tools and we're it's also a common name. It's common people. It's an identification with lots of people. And this is why, by the way, I think great band names are very rarely attached to bands that aren't great. I may not always like them. Like, um, was it King Gizzard and the Wizard Lizard? Um, great name for a band. I don't like them, but great name for a band and they're great at what they do, for example. But all of the lyrics on this album are kitchen 
sing melodramas. They're snatches of life, which you don't hear talked about in songs very much. So, for example, Reel Around the Fountain, which addresses the Moors murderers um, in some respect. It's time the tale were told of how you took a child and you made him old, for one thing is, is part of it. But also, of course, um, the other kind of element is also in Suffer Little Children about over the moors, take me to the moors, dig a shallow grave and I'll lay me down. You know, the idea that there was this kind of a ghost of murder and mortality that, that hung over Manchester. And as I've mentioned before, Bible John and the Birmingham Six and the terrorist bombings, this sense of a great evil that hung over the land. And there wasn't very much that you could do about that. It was just there. It was built in. It was in the tap water. You know, like there was heart, cold and misery was the third tap. Or if in Scotland, iron brick. And you listen to the songs and the music of the songs and the way that the guitar worked is not lead and it's not rhythm. It's kind of almost like guitar, cheap, funk, Motown. There was an element of that. It wasn't played like a traditional lead guitarist. Traditional lead guitarist would be your Jimmy Page that would do a one minute, 42 second solo. And you'd sit there and, you know, you could hear your hair growing if you didn't like the solo in the middle of Dazed and Confused. Um, the bass had a fantastic role in the Smiths, which is very underrated. Andy Rourke's a phenomenal bass player. He plays bass effectively as almost like a second lead guitar in a lower register. So effectively, you've got two melody lines that are duetting with each other. Um, and as I've said, drums are really, really important in a band. There's a degree of punctuation in how that song works. And then what Morrissey did with his vocal placements um, is when, if you listen to the instrumental versions of Smith songs, you would never go, ah, the vocal goes there the vocal is in a completely different place to where you expect it to be the melody exists in a different place and it kind of dances on top of the music as a separate image almost as if something has been pasted in on top of works perfectly but you'd listen to the, the smith songs and you go that would be the chorus that isn't the chorus that's the middle eight you know the break you'd listen to another part and you go that's the chorus and you go no that's the intro you know or that's a guitar riff that he plays twice right at the end the unique lyrical lexicon that the band put forward portrayed a world which to most people in England we recognised but to people in America or perhaps into Chile or somewhere you would listen to it and you go I don't know what is a punctured bicycle on a hillside desolate in Britain you would know exactly what was going on you've driven up to the hills on your bicycle because you're fed up and you've got a puncture and now you've got to walk past and it's probably foggy and raining and it's probably October and it's going to get dark soon and you're annoyed will nature make a man of me yet when will I have the things which make me a man and even that line uh, around you know when does a man become a man tell me if you can um the the element of going well at what point do you stop being a child you know and I, i'm a man now i know that but at some point i was a child and nobody took me into a room and went you're a man now you're in the army now it was like no just one day it just kind of happened and i just forgot that i wasn't a boy anymore you know, that's when it happened. And all of these lyrics, which were about rejection and, and fear and desire and almost humiliation and powerless, are, are really key in articulating, I think, the uncertainty and the, the lack of confidence around masculinity, around what is it to be a man? Will nature make a man of me yet? The, these lines around, uh, you know, what what I don't want to love her, I just want to be seen in the back of your car, or you are your mother's only son and you are a desperate one. The uh, went, Just a rented room in Wally Range, what do we get for our trouble and pain? The, the lyrics in there are around things like, well, you can't buy a house, you have to rent a house. You're not a man, you, you, you're kind of, you're having sex and you're dabbling in that, but it's not successful, you're not very good at relationships to start off with. Um, and, and all of those lyrics that go with it. I know I could probably do, and if I'd have had uh, a slightly different approach, I would have spent all the time talking about the way in which the lyrics of the Smiths, both as a band and the album, address the, the, the fear of masculinity, or more correctly, the fear of toxic masculinity, the, the masculine kind of um, identification elements that you live with, which you've got to have a car, you've got to have a wife, you've got to own a house, you know, you've got to have lovers and all that type of thing. Uh, but then, then Morrissey just comes out and goes, well, all men have secrets and here is mine, so let it be known, you know. Um, and that is a 
the whole of the lyrics on the album are really, if you're not quite sure, well, what is it to be male? What is it to be masculine? What is it to be man, macho? What are you meant to be doing? These are lyrics which are very, very clearly describing suburban British dramas rooted around identity and, and money and uh, prestige and power and humiliation and powerlessness and sometimes the element of actually rejecting all of that proactively to go that isn't the world that i want this is not the you know the the, the world won't listen to what i want the world is telling me what it wants and i don't want to be part of that world it's a rejection of the established world which has been laid out in culture ahead of us and uh, so the very last lyric is oh manchester so much to answer for over the moor i'm on the moor the child is on the moor. The idea that, um, the controversially, the song is written from the point of view of a child that may have been murdered by Myra Hindley and uh, the other fellow whose name I can't remember uh, is fucking evil and dead. And uh, to kind of look at those and go, that was, that's, you know, it, one element of thinking of yourself as, as powerful. Being a god is the power to give life and to take life away. And so, therefore, some people that are murderers think of themselves as, as, as almost godlike because they have the power of life and death over others. And yet the whole of this album is, is kind of like refuting the, 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 the now outdated and old concept of masculinity and male identity and kind of re rejecting all of that and going, no, there's something else. There's a different way of seeing the world and and of going going through all of that so the smiths sorry i seem to have talked myself into a corner here for 55 minutes this is a i think this is a tantalizingly close great album the songs on it are fantastic the sequencing is slightly off the production and performance is not amazing but otherwise it's a very very solid lp and um, you know, for, for something that came out 40 years ago, it really was unlike pretty much anything else that had come out. I think maybe um, the Lloyd Cole and Commotions, the, the Rattlesnakes album, might have been the nearest thing to it at the time. Um, but it was very close to creating a unique world, uh, a world where you were invited to enter and be part of something that was an alternative to the existing and established worlds which had been made and created by others. Now, you might think, oh, that's the end of the story. Oh, no, no, no. There's, there's one extra single which came out on the 30th of March, 1984. Uh, Sandy Shaw, Hand in Glove, backed with I Don't Owe You Anything, on the 12-inch, an acoustic version of Gene. Now, these sound like they're Smith songs. Oh, yes, they are. They are performed by the Smiths. They are produced by John Porter. Sandy Shaw is the lead vocalist. The Smiths are the backing group on this. And if you um, have these records, these... these this 7-inch and this 12-inch, which I don't have the 12-inch because um, yeah, I can never find a copy, um, are absolutely essential pieces of the Smith's puzzle. You absolutely have to have them if you're a Smith's nutter or just a standard Smith's weirdo. Um, and these are, are really brilliant kind of reposts. Think about the band taking their debut single, the one which um, did quite well, but was established as kind of giving it a second lease of life, this time sung by a woman um, with out the band's name on the front and effectively kind of recast themselves almost as a Manchester's version of Lieber and Stoller or, um, you know, Lennon and McCartney uh, writing songs for other artists. Obviously, Tennant and Lowe did it later on with a couple of songs for Dusty Springfield and Liza Minnelli as well. This is a absolutely essential piece of the Smiths puzzle. And if you don't have it and you're a Smiths fan, you really do need to have it. But it's, it's absolutely great. And the acoustic version of Gene is beautiful. It's one of my favourite pieces of music of all time and uh were i god obviously be glad i'm not but were i god i would have made that version of gene the last track on this album um but uh, but there you are the smiths uh hard to believe this is 39 years old and um it's the start of a a beautiful experience actually um which hasn't always stayed that way they were one of the perfect bands of the 80s. Um, as Johnny Marr said, we look like a band all the time. They had an anti-image. They looked like people that you saw at gigs. They looked like people that you saw on the bus. They didn't have stage wear. They didn't have hugely bouffanted rock hair at all or, or anything like that. They 
had the appearance of verisimilitude, and authenticity, and realness, and coming from a world that we recognised, and in a world that seemed so very, very alienating when I was younger, a world which was full of, you know, warrants and uh, bullshit like that. You know, the Smiths were a band that felt like they'd come from the world I lived in, as opposed to a world that rock stars with stripper girlfriends lived in. And it was um, absolutely, you know, a frame for me when I was younger and when I, uh, when my best friends were my records. Now, you could argue my best friends are my records now. Not necessarily the case. My best friends are in this house and some of them are records, but some of them are people. Some of them are cats and uh, some of them aren't in this house. Some of them are out there in YouTube and Twitter land and hey there, how are you doing? I can't wait to see you again. Um, but the Smiths was the creation of almost a, a self-created cult, a self-created world. And this album was an invitation in. So thank you for listening to an hour of me talking about the Smiths. I hadn't expected it to be quite that long, but so be it. Um, and so uh, there we go, 20th of February, 1984, uh, and 20th of February, 2023. I never thought when I first bought this album uh, on vinyl in about 1990 that I would be talking about it 33 years later. To be fair, I thought with all of them, atomized in a mushroom cloud caused by some some mad russian person and who knows there's still time for that to happen but hopefully um, that will never come to pass and because if it's not love it's the bomb that will bring us together uh, but if it's not a bomb it will be a shared love of the same songs that will bring us together uh, when we all go i love that song i love that band and that's the moment where you're kind of in the room together watching a band that you love with people who are like you and you kind of go this is my tribe this is my place this is where i belong and so there we have it the smiths uh, one of the best debut albums of all time uh, imperfect but nearly perfect and uh, it's a record that i've listened to a lot over the years i'm not going to stop um, because inside even though on the outside i'm a middle-aged man with no hair well, the hair's all fallen down to my chin. It's still inside to me. There's still the version of me that existed when I was 16 or 24 or 32. I remember that guy. I'm still that guy, but with extra bits on top now. And I, I can still access to him. And this music, that's the greatest thing about music, is it's a time travel machine. It will take you back to that moment where you first heard those songs and you, you kind of realise that this, there was, this is the start of something that will be with you forever. Um, what a wonderful experience it has been. Anyway, I'm going to stop yakking because I've been 62 minutes in, which is quite a while. Thank you for patiently putting up with that. If you've watched all of it, you deserve a biscuit and possibly a chocolate muffin. So go and have one of those and I will see you all again some other time soon. Take care of yourselves and each other. Stay beautiful and uh, see you soon. Bye. Wow, that took a long time, didn't it? You thought I'd never shut up. Oh, no, 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 no. Here I am. I'm going to...